So, all right, so this is the second part of week one. Um, last time we met in person and we defined topologies. Um, the idea is that you want to put some kind of material on, let yeah, me fix my audio here. You want to put some kind of material properties on a set, so to speak, right? You want to establish notions of closeness, um, smallness, largeness, uh, nearness, like of different points. Uh, you want to be able to characterize how many holes something has. So you put a topology on a set, and that lets you ascribe those notions to the set. Right? So this is super general, because anything we do in mathematics or engineering or uh, physics, you can describe by sets. Right? Maybe locations or velocities or something like that form sets. So we define topologies. Right? So you take a power set of a set, and then you take some of those subsets, and there are four conditions that have to be met in order for that subset of the power set to be the topology. If you have a topological, or excuse me, if you have a topology, you have then a um, topological space. Okay, let's go to that. All right, so a pair of a set with a topology on that set, as in here, is a topological space. Uh, we talked about, let's see, bases for topologies. We talked about some standard topologies, um, like the metric topology on R and R2 and Rn for an En. How to extract a topology from a metric to get metric spaces or metric topologies. Uh, provided a couple exercises here. And then we talked about the structure of sets in topological spaces. Uh, so sets may be open, they may be closed, they may be both, they may be neither. They may also have different properties, right? So um, some of the points in open sets uh, maybe, or some of the points in sets, in fact, might be limit points. Uh, you can take the closure of different subsets of a topological space. So we talked about that a little bit. Um, we talked about interior points, uh, boundaries of sets, isolated points of sets, exterior points of sets. So here's a little diagram showing off all these basic kinds of points within a set or nearby a set. Okay. And this is just a closed ball um, of radius one, centered at zero in R2. And you remove the closed ball of radius one fifth. Uh, centered at zero. Uh, let's see, Jack says you can't see the screencast. Let me double check. All right. So yeah, you, you basically form an annulus where the outside is closed and the inside is open by taking a closed ball in R2, and then you remove a closed ball inside it that's strictly smaller. And then you get things that are not in the set, right? The, the boundary of that removed interior closed ball uh, forms limit points of the set that you're looking at, the annulus, but those aren't elements of the set. Also, any of the points on the interior or on the boundary of this annulus are limit points, but this is kind of like the canonical one. Right. The most obvious to point out is the limit point. Um, so we have another right here. Uh, interior points are always limit points. Let's see, and exterior points are points that you can draw a little. So we're working in R2, right? So the open sets are patches. The basic open sets are patches around points. So you can draw a neighborhood, this green neighborhood right here around this point, and that neighborhood doesn't intersect the gray set at all, so we say that it's an exterior point of that set. All right? If I can separate the point by an open neighborhood from the set, then it's an exterior point. And I can't get rid of that. There we go. Um, let's see. So these are just some of the basic ideas that we'll work with as we're uh, building up more complex topological spaces and looking at sets within them. And we have another notion of open and closed sets. So I don't remember if we got to this last time, but uh, a set is open if and only if it equals its interior. So every point in the topological space or in the, in the set is an interior point, then it's open. And this is true of all um, topological spaces, every subset of a topological space. So we give a little short proof of it right here. I have someone who keeps joining and leaving, so I don't know. Um, it's making noise. And then a set is closed if and only if every limit point of the set is contained within the set. So not every point of the set needs to be necessarily a limit point, but if there's a limit point of the set in the topological space, the ambient space that it's living in, then in order for that set to be closed, it needs to contain that limit point. Okay. So, you know, um, this is not closed because these points on this interior boundary are not um, contained within the set, although they are limit points. So this is not closed um, set. <clears throat> right. The other way you would check this, recall, is that you would take the complement of it and check that it's open. And well, it's not because if you take the complement on the inside, you get a closed ball, which is not open. And of course, the complement on the outside is an open set, but the fact that this is not open kind of messes you up. 
All right. <clears throat> so we briefly talked about connectedness. So the idea is I want to see if a, I, I can reach parts of my topological space from the others in some sense. So the idea is you take a set in a topological space, and if you can fill in or if you can wrap around it uh, two open sets that are disjoint from each other, then that set is to, said to be not connected, right? It's disconnected. So here's an example. I've got two um, green patches. You take the union of those. That gives you a set. Call it A. And I can wrap around it two open sets, namely U and V. And U and V don't touch each other, so A is disconnected, right? If, you, if there exists a partition like this um, into U and V, then the set is not connected. If there doesn't exist such a partition, then the set is said to be connected. Now, it's a little harder to show that a set is connected, but um, we have a trick for that that I'll show in just a minute <clears throat> in certain cases. Um, it's pretty obvious just from looking at it that you wouldn't be able to uh, construct two open sets that are disjoint from each other that cover this um, because either they overlap and they share interior points or um, they, like, of course, don't have their boundaries. The U and V don't, so they can't contain everything in the green set. And you can just check this doing some kind of contradiction proof. Um, and every space can be decomposed into connected components. Was there a question? Okay. Um, yeah, so if a set's connected, then we say it has one connected component, and the whole set is the connected component of the set, the only one. Otherwise, you can decompose a set uniquely into a certain number of connected components, whether that's a finite amount or a countable or uncountable inf infinity of amounts. Uh, doesn't matter. It just There's a unique number of connected components that a space can be decomposed into, and each of those connected components are the maximal uh, connected subsets of the set with respect to inclusion. So it's kind of obvious what's going on there. The connected components of A in this case are just the part that's in U and the parts in, that is in V. Uh, there's only one connected component of this set because, well, it's connected. Okay. Um, an example of a connected set is the, let's see, is this connected or no? This set is connected. So this is the topologist sine curve and it's given parametrically this way. And the idea is if you contain U in any kind of open set, where'd I go? Then you're going to have some non zero um, diameter in the X direction for your open patch that contains the green part, the U. And that's going to intersect V at infinitely many places. Okay? Because you, if you extend to the right of U at all, then you intersect V. And you must extend to the right of U, otherwise, um, U is not interior points of the open set containing U. And so that's not an open set anymore. Right? You have to have only interior points to be an open set. So loosely, that's why this is connected. I can't wrap something around V and something around U that are both disjoint and open. open. That's all the feedback. Let me read that a little bit. All right. So. We were going to look at a trick for uh, checking if things are connected because it's really easy to check sometimes if they're disconnected by because you just construct an example of two open sets, right? U and V, and they're disjoint and they contain the whole open uh, the set that you're looking at. And the other way around is not so easy because you have to do some kind of contradiction proof. Um, a trick is to show that the space is path connected, which implies that it is connected. So if you can um, take any two points in the space and you can draw a path with your pen between those two points, um, excuse me, if you can take any two points in a set and draw a path through the set uh, without picking up your pen at all that goes between the two points, then it's said that the set is path connected. So we have to define paths to begin with, so we need a notion of continuity uh, before we do that. So that's all up here. <clears throat> so if you've got two topological spaces, okay, X and Y, and each has its own topology, of course, they don't have to be the same. X and Y don't have to be the same as each other, but they can. And the topologies don't have to be the same, but they can be. Right? So oftentimes you'll see X is the real numbers, Y is the real numbers, and these are both the standard topology on R. Um, but in general, a function F from the topological space X to the topological space Y is continuous if every open set in Y maps through the inverse of F to give you an open set in X. Okay? So it seems a little bit strange, right? Usually you don't, um, in elementary mathematics, you don't map 
sets through inverses of functions, you might sometimes look at like what happens if you take the domain of a function and map it through that function forward, and in which case you get the range of the function. Right, so if I take, for instance, just to give an example of this, I take um, f mapping from r to r, and I look at the function specifically f of x equals x squared, then what happens if I map all of r through f? Well, it's every point that I can reach by plugging in a number into f, and so that's going to just be, well, think about the parabola, what's the range? So it's the non-negative numbers, right? So that's going to be um, y in r, such that y is greater than or equal to zero. That's all the stuff I can reach by squaring a real number. Okay? But the other way around is a little bit different. So let's look at what inverse mapping does with the same function squared. And if you, for instance, hang on, I'm getting yanked around by my touch screen here. Uh, you look at, let's say, maybe one to two. So that's the open interval from one to two. And you look at the inverse of that under f. What are all the numbers that map to the open interval one to two by squaring them? So it should be, you know, you look at the parabola and you draw a one and two on the um, foot domain, so the y-axis, and you look at everything in the parabola that maps to that. Oops, a bit off. Okay. So that's just this strip right here. So it looks like the y is going to be, you kind of have to find the inverse algebraically, but it's going to be square root of two over there, and then this one is going to be one. So it should be the same on both sides, right? Because the parabola is symmetric. So you end up getting this thing. Negative square root of two to negative one. Union one, two, square root of two. So in general, it's really annoying to have to evaluate this thing. No. But we'll come up with tricks later that will oftentimes make it easier to check if things are continuous. We'll have heuristics too, like any polynomial is a continuous function. Um, any rational function is continuous. Is that right? Yes, it is. Okay. So, where were we? Um, it's an exercise I give that, you know, if you have taken real analysis and you're familiar with the definition of con continuity, uh, that you should show that this definition of continuity agrees with the epsilon delta definition of continuity with limits and so on. Um, I should say that you can be continuous at a particular point, um, which means that if you look, I think it is that you look at the uh, neighborhoods of the image of the point. So if I want to say that f is continuous at x, usually you don't do this in topology, but um, you want to say f continuous at x, you would say something like um, for all neighborhoods, of x, or excuse me, of f of x in the codomain. So these are open neighborhoods. Um, there is a open set. I should be doing for all. There exists some open set in the neighborhoods of f of x <laughs> such that v is a subset of u and f inverse of v is open. So you say there's a refinement of every open neighborhood uh, at the image of x um, that maps back through the inverse function to give you an open function, or to give you an open set. So this is kind of tedious. We usually don't deal with this because we're mostly concerned with just continuous functions in topology. We really don't look at discontinuous ones. Um, just to give an example of something that might violate your intuition as well, you may be used to thinking of the function 1 over x as being discontinuous, but in topology, we don't think of it as being so. So I'll leave it also as an exercise. I won't write it, but um, maybe I did give it in the Discord. But either way, uh, the function f of x taking you, so I should write this way, from the domain of negative infinity to 0, union 0 to infinity, both open, to the real numbers, uh, given by x maps to 1 over x, show that this is continuous. So even though it looks like it should be discontinuous, if you use the definition of saying, okay, I should be able to draw with my pen without picking it up, 
um, still it turns out it's continuous. Just because there's no point in the domain of the function, which is all the non-zero numbers, uh, where I can't locally draw without picking up a pin. So that's continuity. So yeah, you have polynomial functions being continuous. You have um, on on real number spaces. Um, you have rational functions, so like one over x, one over x plus three, x plus seven, all over x cubed minus four. That would be continuous. Anything like this. There's a notion that's a little bit stronger than continuity called homeomorphism. Okay. So homeomorphism is a continuous function. Okay. And in fact, in topology, we're always going to think of functions and maps as being continuous. We're never going to deal with anything that isn't. So that's a little note I give right here. But just keep that in mind. So a homeomorphism, you might think of as sometimes people call it a bicontinuous function. So the idea is it's continuous, it's invertible because it's a bijection, and it also has a continuous inverse. Okay? So in order for a function f of x to be continuous, so it needs to map from x to y, so it needs to have open sets here, um, open to open, right? It needs to map through the inverse, open sets to open sets. And it also needs to have um, the property that it is a bijection, so it's one-to-one -one and on-to. So hopefully that's a familiar thing. Um, and then secondly, when you invert it, you should get that the inverse of the inverse map. So this is a function this way. And because it's bijective, you can actually define the inverse as a function. And this is also bijective by virtue of the original function being bijective. And this should map open sets to open sets from x to y. Okay. So really all you have to do is check. Taking an open set in y, does the inverse send me to an open set in x? And if I take an open set in x, am I sent by the original function at, um, f? to an open set in y. If you have that, and the function is known to be bijective, then you know that you have a homeomorphism. Okay. So for us in topology, homeomorphisms are precisely the isomorphisms okay, of topological spaces. So if we say two spaces are topologically equivalent or of the same topological type, then that means that they're homeomorphic. There exists a homeomorphism between them. Okay. And some supporting terminology is just open maps and closed maps. So an uh, open map sends forward open sets to open sets, right? Instead of being continuous, which is when you send backwards open sets to open sets, um, open map is forward. And a closed map just sends forward closed um, sets to closed sets. Okay. Closed sets in the domain to closed sets in the codomain. And being continuous has nothing to do with being open or closed. Okay. It does not imply one way or the other. Another um, characterization of homeomorphisms is that you have a bijective continuous function, which is also an open map, and that's good enough. Um, it's an exercise that one should find an open map and closed map, neither of which are homeomorphisms. Now, that's not the same thing as homomorphism, so I write that here. This is an idea from category theory. Um, and this is just noting like what the different basic objects and morphisms in the topological category are. The objects are topological spaces. Homomorphisms are precisely the continuous functions, so that's why we never talk about any non-continuous functions, because they aren't even in the category of topo topological spaces. Um, the isomorphisms are precisely the hom homeomorphisms, and the initial object is the empty set, just like in the category of sets, and the final object, also just like in the category of sets, is the singleton set. I'm coming back after the recording session to cover something that I completely forgot to touch on uh, while everyone was here, so... The entire reason that I introduced con continuous functions on topological spaces is so that we can introduce the notion of a path and then talk about path-connected spaces, which is a stronger notion than connectedness, right? So we leave that as an exercise. So if you have a path-connected space, the exercise is to show that it's also connected, right? And moreover, we wanted to show that this topologist sine curve that we were looking at, although it's connected, is not path-connected, right? And that's an exercise as well. So the notion here of paths is that you take a function which is continuous and it maps from the interval i, which is zero to one, closed in the real numbers. Um, you know, it has a standard topology inherited as a subspace of the real numbers. And it maps to x. Uh, we call this a path in x from a, which is the starting point at f of zero, to b, which is the ending point at f of one. This is just nomenclature, right? This isn't extra definition. We're just saying that a is equal to this, uh, the starting point, and b is the end point. So the path, you can kind of think intuitively that it's mapping this interval, time interval, kind of um, continuously into x. So you get some kind of curve. 
So let x be a topological space. Let little x be a point in x. The set uh, of all y values or y points in x, such that there exists a path in x from x to y. Right. You so you fix the point x, and then you ask, what points can I find a path that takes me from x to y? Um, namely, those points I'm asking about are y. Uh, that set of points is called a path component of x containing little x. Okay. So the idea is, what points can you reach from a particular point? That's called a path component. The topological space X is said to be path connected if it has only one path component. So this is much like the idea of connected components, right? So some people will call this sometimes path connected components. Um, so in fact, it turns out, let's see that um, you have at least as many path components in a topological space as you have connected components. And if two points lie in different connected components, then they certainly lie in different path components. Right. So it's an exercise, of course, to show that you can't take a path from anywhere in U to anywhere in V. And it should be pretty easy to prove that. You do it by some kind of contradiction argument. <clears throat> now, path connectedness has really weird properties. Like we can construct something called the Sierpinski space, which is a set made of two points, A and B. And the topology is really minimal, right? So the power set's already small because it only has, what, two to the power of two or four many elements or subsets of X. Whereas the topology, we just take one of those away, right? So we have the empty set, we have the set containing A and B, and we also have the set containing just A. Those are the open sets in this topology. Um, you can check, of course, that this is a topology. And it looks like this if you draw it out, okay? And the claim is that this is actually a path-connected space, okay? We give a proof here. If you're interested, you can read through this. But um, the idea is that you construct a path from A to B that looks like this, where you stay at A for all but one point in the domain of the path, or the time of the path's traversal, same thing. And then you suddenly jump to B for an instant, and then that's it. That's the path. It's continuous, and it takes you from A to B. Simple. Now, the continuity relies on you actually taking open sets in um, the Sierpinski space and mapping them back through the inverse of the path map which is G in our case, and then checking that those open sets uh, map back to, through G inverse, uh, open sets in the interval zero to one, right? So the open sets are purely, there's only three you gotta check in the Sierpinski space, which are X itself, so that automatically maps back to give you all of the interval because, well, the domain is a subset of um, the inverse image of, or excuse me, the pre-image of, uh, X, right? The domain must be in the pre-image of the codomain, certainly, or of the range, I should say. Uh, the empty set is, of course, uh, it maps back to the pre-image, which is the empty set, in the interval zero to one. And then A maps back through the inverse map to give you zero closed to one open, which is open in the interval um, with the standard topology on it. So this turns out actually to be a path, right? It's continuous. And it satisfies the conditions for a path going from A to B, and so therefore the Sierpinski space is path connected. Okay. Um, also, I went through and I fixed the definition of the product topology at the end, so that has been repaired. Let me see if I can find that real quick. I think it might be on the third page. No, fourth. No, it's, it should be the fifth page. Near the top here. So just to show, this is the corrected definition of the product topology on finite Cartesian products. Okay. Or a pairwise Cartesian product, where you take a product of x and y. Okay. All right, back to the original recording. So we're almost done because I just wanted to get up through some of the product and subspace stuff. I know we talked about this a little bit before the um, session last Friday, just particularly the subs subspace stuff, uh, but not everybody was there for it. And then compactness as well. And then we'll be done with that. So the idea here is that we can take projections, which are surjective maps or onto maps. Um, and we can also take restrictions of functions namely continuous functions, um, which are kind of, in essence, the same thing as inclusions, which are injective maps, um, or one-to-one -one functions. And we can take those and we can use them to build new topological spaces, right? We've already got some examples, like we have the real numbers, we have 
any metric space you can create. We have Rn. Uh, we have different spherical spaces, like spaces like S1, S2, S3, so on. Um, lots of things. And we want to build new spaces out of those as building blocks. So we have two tools, essentially, for doing that. And they are subspace topologies and product topologies. So a subspace is the following. You take a topological space, X, with the topology, T. You take a subset of the topology or excuse me, a subset of the topological space. Okay. So it's just some set living in a topological space. That subset inherits a natural topology just from living in the topological space X. Right? So A is the subset, and it inherits a topology from X called the subspace topology. And the idea is you just take the open sets in the bigger topology, the ambient space, okay? and you intersect them with the subset, and that gives you op open sets on the subset, or the subspace, I should say. So we looked at an example um, that was really nice in the beginning of the class um, on Friday, which was, you know, I have a natural topology, the standard topology, in fact, on R2. Right, so what is R2? So it's x, y. So I draw two axes, and R2 can be described set theoretically as the following. So it's all the pairs x, y, where x and y are in the real numbers. Okay. And this, of course, has a natural metric given, you know, by the Euclidean distance. And that metric spits out a topology, a metric topology, which is just the open batches, right? So you intuitively kind of know what that is. Um, an open set might be something like this, a patch which doesn't contain the boundary. So all the points are interior. So that seems natural. Now, the circle is a subset of R2, because I can draw a circle in the plane. And we can characterize it. So let's firstly draw it. So I'm going to draw a unit circle. And then move it just a little bit. And let's characterize this set theoretically. So we'll say S1 is the circle. It just stands for a one-dimensional sphere. And it's characterized this way. So it's X, Y, so pairs of real numbers. And it's a, I should say, it's a subset of R2. And it's characterized by the Pythagorean relation, X squared plus Y squared equals one. So it's just all the points in the plane satisfying that. Now, I'm not drawing exactly right, but you get the idea. It's centered at zero and has radius one. So it is the boundary of um, the open ball. So what I would say is S1 is equal to the boundary of the open ball. And maybe we'll even make it a closed ball. Centered at zero with radius one. That's another way to characterize it. Now, you can look at open sets in... R2 and figure out what the open sets in the subspace topology on this circle should be. So what those are, are things like this. Right, so that doesn't intersect the circle at all, so it doesn't contribute to the topology on the circle. It's kind of irrelevant. However, if I take a set that looks something like this, then it's pretty clear how this intersects with the circle. Right, So it gives me an open set, which is just this part. Maybe I should uh, use a different color. Good. Okay. So that's an open set on the circle. And you can think, you know, what do all the open sets have to look like? Well, they have to just be patches, much like on the real number line. And then you have this one kind of special open set, which is the whole circle, right? So here's another one. And then you have the whole circle being an open set, and then the empty set being an open set. So the subspace topology is just open sets comprising the intersections of the subset that you're establishing a topology on with open sets in the ambient space, so R2 in this case. Um, here we're looking at the closed ball of a particular radius centered somewhere in R2 and trying to establish some open sets on it by the subspace topology procedure. And it's quite clear that, you know, these open sets probably come from something that looks like this. This wouldn't contain the boundary, even though it seems to have like some kind of boundary here, right? Still, this is open in the subspace topology on the closed ball, right? And then you might have another that's something like this. And then the other one's just fine, right? This is already an open set in R2. So this is open sets that contributed to giving these open sets on the uh, closed ball in the subspace topology on it. And we just say that that's a topological subspace in the end of R2. And I've deleted too much. That's fine. Whatever, you get the idea. Okay. So that's it for subspaces. That's probably the most common thing we use, right? We build all kinds of things out of that. For instance, um, I'll give an example. In general, 
Sn, or sorry, let's say I want to look at Rn. We kind of have an intuitive notion of what this is. It's just n-dimensional vector space, real scalar coefficients. Simple. You can build from this a topology on a unit sphere of dimension n uh, minus 1. So what is this thing? Well, this is always equal to um, x1, x2, so on, through xn. So these are just the coordinates in the n-tuple are in. And they have to square to give you, and well, you take the sum of the squares, and you get 1. So canonically, this is the um, n minus 1 sphere. And this gives you the natural topology on that. So this is actually how you construct general spheres. And I've deleted this again. Okay. So there's a whole new class of topological spaces we can now work with. Um, S3 in particular has some interesting properties for um, integral submanifolds and contact topology. So maybe later we'll deal with that. It's hard to visualize these spaces, though. But you can build things you can't really visualize. Uh, why not use products of R mod 1? Well, I'm not sure what you mean. R mod 1. Oh, you're thinking about intervals, right? So yeah, so we'll actually see how to do that in just a second. So what you're saying is like i to the n. So this is, yeah, that's good. So in R, you have um, 0 to 1 is a subset of R. Oops, by the way. Okay. And this inherits a natural topology. And you might think of the open sets. You know, this is R. Here's 0 to 1. And the open sets look something like this. So you might have one that looks like this, another one that looks like this, some in the interior. You know, but these can or may not contain their endpoints. Okay, so you can have a set that's open. So I should say this is. Let's see how would I write this? Zero to one half open is in the topology, the subspace topology on zero to one. Okay. Also, you have 0 to 1 half both sides being open is in the topology on 0 to 1. So this is a little bit different from R because this is not really an open set in R. However, uh, I formed this because this is the intersection. I should say it's equal to the intersection of negative 1 half with 1 half uh, with 0 to 1. And so that's how you can kind of see that it's an open set in the subspace topology on 0 to 1. Closed. And canonically, we have a name for this, right? So this, with the subspace topology inherited from R, is called I, called the interval, the closed interval. Okay. You can do this also um, in general Rn, and you get something called In, which is just 0 to 1 uh, cross 0 to 1, cross dot dot dot, cross 0 to 1, and you do that in many times, and then you give this the subspace topology from Rn. So this is n many times. And this will give you boxes, like some kind of box thing. And uh, let's see. I should say that normally when we build these kinds of spaces with a lot of Cartesian products involved, we don't use the subspace topology and inherit from Rn. We'll usually use the product topology, and it's more natural to think about the topology in that context. Um, though this gives you the exact same topology in certain cases, like this one. Um, it's just that. The product topology is a little bit more powerful where we can use it. And it leads to the idea of bundles later. So let's look at that. Okay. So let's see. Um, I might also leave as an exercise that the subspace topology so R is equal to I should say it's homeomorphic to and I'll usually use this notation for homeomorphism, homeomorphic spaces, which is an equal sign with a little tilde above it. And we could write x0 for x in R is a subspace of R2. So R2, R can be thought of as a subspace of the plane, a subset. And then the exercise would be show the standard topology on R. is the same as the subspace topology inherited 
as a subset of or from R2. So lots of different ways to construct the same spaces, and you get the same thing essentially no matter how you do it, as long as you're not too crazy about it. One way to get kind of different spaces is to build a subbasis or something, and then do the subbasis completion to get the topology. Right? Because subbases are easy to construct, you just need an open cover or a cover of a set, and then it turns out that it is an open cover after the completion to give you a topology. Okay. So two more things, just product topologies and compactness, and then we'll look at some standard spaces. And then I'll give a couple of theorems and exercises at the end. Okay. Um, hopefully that answers the question. So R mod 1 is I for us. If you haven't taken group theory or ring theory or something, then that mod notation is group quotient. Right? Uh, gluing 0 to 1. So gluing 0 to 1 will give us... Oh, yeah, I'm being a little stupid. Yeah, you'll get S1. So let's see. You're saying characterize S1 as R mod 1 instead of looking at it as a subspace. You can do that. We actually will look at quotient spaces later, especially when we do, um, I think, homology on, no, when we do homotopy in CW complexes. Um, for the fundamental group in particular, we'll look at. Um, quotient spaces, but I'm trying to keep that away from right now. It, you can do that. You can actually, so yeah, we should say R S1 is equivalent. It's homeomorphic to R um, either with a one-point compactification, which we'll see later, hopefully, or um, there's not a nice way to do this as a quotient topology. Usually what you'll do is take I itself and then glue again together the endpoints. So you have like some kind of equivalence relation where you say, okay, um, zero is equivalent to one. And then you mod out that equivalence relation for I, and it says that zero and one get stuck together. And well, you get a circle because you're taking an interval, closed interval, and you're gluing these two points together and you get a circle, much like you would imagine. Okay. But we'll look at that when we do cellular complexes. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to construct the same spaces, but those generalize to more diverse kind of situations, so we need to see them either way. Um, there's a bunch of standard objects in topology. Like right now, we're dealing with just standard generic topological spaces, and in particular metric spaces. But you also have simplicial complexes, so that's what we're kind of looking at up here. You also have simplicial complexes, so simplices, they're kind of like triangles or tetrahedra or generalizations of that idea. You also have CW or cellular complexes, which we'll look at when we do Morse theory. Um, you have sum and product operations, which you normally think of as being on cellular complexes. So they let you like glue different spaces together. Um, here I show a connected sum. So you basically chop out a little patch of two subsets of a topological space, and then you glue them together by a cylinder. That's a connected sum. It takes a disconnected space and connects it. Uh, you also have the wedge product, which takes two um, sets, which each have a specified point in each of them, and it unifies those two points together. So it kind of does a quotient at one point, right? It glues them. Um, there's all different kinds of other such constructions like that. And then once we are doing, yeah, while we're doing CW complexes, we'll also need to look at quotient topologies and fundamental polygons and polytopes, which let us form surfaces and stuff really naturally. So we can make like Klein bottles with really simple diagrams like this. And that's kind of related to what Jack was talking about, just gluing things together and having a rigorous way of doing that and dealing with a topology that you get at the end. Okay. So product spaces are the following. If you have two topological spaces, namely X and Y, okay, and you have, of course, a topology on each, I'm losing myself here, then you can take a Cartesian product of the two, right? So we know how to do that in sets. And the idea is you just say, okay, what's the Cartesian product of X and Y? Well, that's, as a set, it's all the pairs of elements from X and Y. Okay. Oops, I lost my mark there. And there's a natural topology that is inherited on that by, um, or I should say from the individual topologies on X and Y, respectively. 
<clears throat> so the idea is, um, let's see here. Let's look just at R2. Right, so that's a Cartesian product of R and R. In fact, that's exactly equal to it, not only homeomorphic. Okay. So what are the open sets in R2? Well, we could think of them in terms of the metric construction, right? How we normally get metric topologies with open balls, or we can think of it as being a product topology um, or a product space. So the way we think of it as a product space is you look at the projection onto the individual Rs, right? So I can, in general, let's do this in the general case, if I can scroll away here. Um, in general, you're going to have x cross y is the product space, and then you have two projections, one down to x and one down to y, and what do these look like? So this is pi 1, pi 2 is the notation I'll give. And the idea is if you have a point in x cross y, well, it looks like this, x and y. And if I map down through pi 1 to the left into x, I just get x. So let's say pi 1 of x and y is just x. And pi 2 of x and y needs to be an element of y, so the natural one to choose is just y. Okay. So in R2, the projections that we deal with are just left and right as well. And that map looks like this. So this is pi 1 over to r. And then you also have pi 2 over to r. And it's exactly the same setup. So pi 1 of xy equals x, and pi 2 of xy equals y. Okay. And if you had a Cartesian product of three different spaces, then you would have a pi 3 as well. Right? For the tuples, you would have a third projection map, which takes you know, x, y, and z and maps to z. Now, let's see. What do the open sets need to be? Um, so the idea is I want to check if, hmm, let me think about how to construct this so that we don't get something messed up. Because I'm thinking about weird stuff, like what if I take in R2 something to this effect? So it like contains part of the boundary here, and then the rest of it's kind of open boundary. Well, you might think X and Y coordinates. So how would this project to give me open sets in the individual X and Y coordinates? Right, it wouldn't, because in X, you get this thing open. And in Y, you get this thing open, so it seems like it kind of avoids the issue. Right, it seems like it kind of subverts the notion of projecting down onto X and Y axes. Um, let's see, let me make sure I gave the definition properly. I think this is slightly off. So what we can do, hmm. oh, I see. So what you do is you fix one of the um, coordinates. Okay. So let's say I fix y at, say, 0 0.5 or something. And then I look at the range of x values that satisfy that. Okay. So I take this set is um, pi 1 of, let me do this with composition notation, pi 2 inverse of This should be restricted to the open set. So we're checking if A is an open set. This whole set here that I've constructed is A. And you restrict this to A, and you check if one half is open. And you just do this for all of the slices that you can construct in either direction. And if it turns out that these are open, then you get an open um, set in the product space. Now. A better way is to look at a basis, because right, this seems kind of tedious, and I don't want to do it analytically if I can avoid it. Sometimes it's useful, because if you're showing that something isn't an open set, you can take a slice through it and show that that slice isn't open. Um, and that slice is given to you by restricting one of the projection maps. Kind of tedious to do analytically, but of course you can draw a picture and kind of figure out what's going on there. Um, 
So what you can do to characterize open sets in terms of a basis is you say the following. Let's see. Actually, let me go grab a definition to double check because I'm missing something from the lecture notes. OK, so that's what I was thinking. You take open sets in each of the things you're taking the Cartesian product of. And we want to get a topology, or a basis for a topology for R2, for R cross R. And that's a set of subsets of R2 uh, given by the following. So take U. Mm. We should do this. We should do U1 cross U2, given that U1 is in the topology on the left R, and U2 is in the topology on the right R. So it's a little bit conflicting here because we're using the same space twice, but if I wanted to do this for um, like a cylinder where you're taking R and S1 and crossing them together, then I would look at this. So it would be u1 cross u2, such that u1 is in the topology on what did I think r first, and then u2 is in the topology on, so it's an open set in the circle. Okay. So you say, okay, I get a basis for the product space, or for the product topology, by taking open sets in each of the um, individual things I'm multiplying together, taking the Cartesian product of right, R and S1, I take open sets in those, and then I cross them together. And this should give me a basis uh, for the topology on the product space. Now, remember, to go from a basis to a topology, I just need to take finite intersections of elements of the basis. Okay, So that allows me to get things that are not convex like this. Although I don't get this because, well, I can't um, get that boundary to be included. So I get something like that is in the product topology. Now I should note, if you're taking, it's, it's possible to take uh, infinite dimensional products okay, or infinite products. So one example you might do is you might take, um, so this is multiplication notation, right? It's like a sum, but instead of adding the things that were, like if I were to write a sum, I would do this kind of thing. Oops, forgetting how to write my signals. So I might take like one through infinity and then have AI or something. So instead of doing this, this is A1 plus A2 plus so on. Um, I might take this kind of notation. And then we might take different topological spaces, I. And this is just x1 cross x2, so on. Okay. So this is a set operation. I'm just doing an infinite Cartesian product. So the elements are tuples, x1, x2, so on, such that x1, in fact, I'm just going to write the general form, each component of the tuple xi needs to live in capital xi. Okay. So this as a set is what this thing is made up of. Right? The tuples are the elements of that infinite Cartesian product. Now you can also take, um, I want to say you can take, in some sense, uncountable Cartesian products, but I'm not sure what the typical way of defining that is. I mean, to me, I would just take like, you know, a product over alpha in some arbitrary index set and then this thing. And then my tuples would just not be writable as a sequence. I wouldn't be able to describe numbers, ascribe numbers to them. So it would be like x alpha for all alpha in i, uh, such that x alpha is in capital X alpha. So this is fine. And in, in fact, it works with the topology that we're about to build. Right? So this allows uncountable Cartesian products. So maybe i is like the real number. So I'm able to ascribe an element of the tuple, a component of the tuple, an entry, for every number on the real number line. And then that would give me an element so of the Cartesian product, the uncountable Cartesian product. Um, but the, there's two ways to define a topology on this. The natural way you might think of is to construct a basis by taking open sets in x1. So you take um, a basis for this product topology, or for this product space. Okay. And you construct that by saying, OK, let's take a infinite product of open sets. And this should be such that ui is open in xi for each i. Oops. Okay. So this does give you a basis for a topology. And it generates, the topology that it generates, the what's called box topology on that product set. 
this is horrible. We don't ever want to do this. Um, I don't know of any actual productive use of the box topology. It's the wrong generalization of the finite product topology, which we were dealing with up here. Okay? So you build a basis when you have a finite Cartesian product this way, and it's fine. To get a workable topology on infinite product spaces like this, you need to form your basis in a slightly different way. You need to require um, the following. So this is going to be the actual product topology on infinite spaces, or infinite Cartesian products, rather than the box topology. Sometimes people call this the Tychonoff, um, Tychonoff product topology. Named after a guy who proves, of course, Tychonoff's theorem. Um, and I forget what it's about right now, but they have it in any introductory topology course. It's just that we won't use it much, if at all, in differential topology. Um, so the basis that you use is the following. So same construction as far as what kinds of um, products you're taking, but you have a restriction on the open sets that you're using when you take those products. So you have UI open in X, I, but you also require that only um, and all but finitely many UI, so these open sets that you're taking and the individual things you're taking the product of, uh, all but finitely many must equal xi for that particular i choice. Okay. <clears throat> we won't really deal with this. I just wanted to say, you know, this doesn't generalize to infinite Cartesian products without some extra work, right? Some extra attention. It turns out that these two are the same on um, finite Cartesian products, of course, because, you know, all but finitely many UI must equal XI. Well, you only have finitely many UI to begin with if you have a finite Cartesian product. So you don't have to worry about it in those cases. And the manifolds we're going to look at in um, differential topology, for the most part, are going to be finite dimensional, so you don't have to worry about this. Okay? But if you are trying to build exotic spaces, you do need to know about this. Like if you're building infinite dimensional manifolds or something, you need to know about this thing. Okay. So that's really all there is to be said about product topologies. Um, you get the same, you know, you can use it as an exercise to show that R2 is the same whether you take um, the metric topology, which is the standard topology, or you take the product topology from R with the standard topology on it. Okay. All right, so one more small topic, compactness. So the idea is, like, you don't have in topologies a way of measuring distances. Oftentimes, a topology will come from a metric space, right, or a metric. But you lose the notion of the metric when you are dealing with a topology. You may not even have a metric to begin with sometimes. So still there's a way to characterize whether sets are small in some sense, like if they extend for infinitely long or something. So how do we actually characterize that in terms of the topology? Okay. So here it says we can't measure diameter of sets if we may not have if we don't have a metric. So historically it came first that you know the idea was this. You take um, let's let's say you've got like R2 that you're living in and you want to take a, a bounded set which is closed. So you take some kind of closed set. And recall, topology initially started in terms of closed sets. They weren't dealing with open sets at the start. And at some point before that, they were even about sequences. So this is kind of related to that sequence characterization. So you take a closed bounded set, so something that you can actually draw on the real plane that doesn't go off to infinity in any direction. And you can characterize the fact that it's closed and bounded by the following property. Fill it up with one point, and then another point, and then another, and another, and keep doing this forever. And try to space them out. Okay. If you do this with infinitely many points, if you put infinitely many points inside the closed bounded set, it will turn out that the blue, the point, the set of blue points that I've constructed will have some limit point. They'll cluster up somewhere. I can't space them out at non-negligible distances forever. Um, yeah, so with the metric, you have a notion of spacing them out. You can actually measure the distance between, and you can say, okay, pick some small epsilon and make sure that the distances between are all bigger than epsilon. So if I have a metric like I do on R2, I can do that. Right? I can say, okay, pick epsilon to be 1 over a trillion, put all my infinitely many points, um, pairwise distance of more than epsilon away from each other. And I try to do that, and it turns out I'm going to fail because, well, it's a closed bounded space. It's a, you can use it as an exercise if you want to try to show that that's the case, but, I mean, it's 
kind of obvious intuitively, right? I can't fit infinitely many things more than a certain distance away from each other in a closed bounded space, limited size. Um, in terms of a topology, when you don't have a metric, so you can't do anything with that epsilon notion anymore, uh, the idea is you just say, okay, put an infinite collection of points in the set and ask if you have a limit point in the set. Okay. Now, boundedness is not enough for this because think of an open ball in R2. All right, let's just look separately over here. I can take, so this has an interior, I can take infinitely many points starting right here, 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 and coalescing right here, but never actually um, going outside the set and asymptotically approaching the boundary, which isn't contained in the set. And this set will not have a limit point in the red set, right? Because it's open, it doesn't have the boundary. It, the blue points do have a limit point, but that limit point is an element purely of R2. It's not an element of this open set that we've constructed. So this is not a limit point compact set because I've constructed an infinite subset of that set, which does not contain, um, or does not yield a limit point contained within the set that I'm asking about whether it's limit point compact or not. Okay. So basically, can you stuff infinitely many points in there without getting limit points? If you can, then it's not limit point compact. If you can't, if you always get limit points, then it's limit point compact. Right, so it's a theorem that, um, due to Heine and Burrell, that limit point compactness in subsets of Rn, Euclidean spaces, is equivalent to being closed and bounded. Okay, so it's a nice characterization of closeness and boundedness. Um, S1 is limit point compact, right? So I can draw a circle. I don't even have to draw it in R2, I can just think of a circle abstractly. And, um, necessarily with the standard topology on S1, I have limit point compactness, All right? Because you draw a circle and you try to stuff infinitely many points in there and you're going to have them clustering up somewhere, All right? I can make them all just cluster up in one place, but still there's a cluster point, a limit point. And that would be in this case right here. An open limit point compact set. Let me think about that. Um, this one is open. In fact, every topological space is a limit point compact subset of itself, as well as an open subset of itself. Right. You must check the definition of topology to make sure that it is in fact open. But yeah, the whole space in the topology on that space, namely S1, uh, is open. Right. Because recall, a topology has to have two things be open guaranteed, right? The empty set and the whole space, the whole set must be open. and so. I can't get limit points. Um, let's see. Is that quite right? I should say that that doesn't always happen because you don't always get um, limit points inside. But if you take a compact set and then you look at the subspace topology on that set, you take, okay, let me be more specific. I'll just write down what the rule is. So take ambient set or space, any that you want. So topological space. Okay. Take a subset of X, which is limit point compact. You gotta actually check that it is, otherwise this doesn't work. Let A have the subspace topology inherited from X. Then think about what's happening. Well, because it's limit point compact in this context, I can fill it up with infinitely many points. And no matter what, that collection of infinitely many points is going to exhibit a limit point in A, because it's a subset of A. Right? And so it has limit points. Now, if I let A be a subspace of X and I give it the subspace topology, inherited from X, then because A is the entire space that I'm now looking at, it must be open. And it still has that limit point compactness property. Okay. Because the way you check for limit points, as we had in the definition of limit points, is the same in the subspace topology as it is in the ambient space. 
it comes purely from the definition of limit point. I forget where that is. It's probably here, right? So yeah, you, you have a general procedure for constructing open limit point compact sets. So then we say, okay, then A is an open LP compact set in the topological space A, tau, I guess we'll write restricted to A for the subspace topology on A. Okay. Or I could write intersection if you like. Just some kind of shorthand notation. So this is a topological space and A is an open limit point compact subset. Okay. Now, historically it was the case that limit point compactness was easy to check and easy to come up with, but it turned out later that, um, and also we have that any finite set is automatically limit point compact. So if it's made up of finitely many points, it's limit point compact. Um, in practice, it turns out that there's a more useful notion of compactness. So measuring smallness, right? How, how much stuff can you stuff inside? So regular compactness, or I should just say compactness, is the following. If you take a topological space and then you take a subset and you want to ask, is it compact? Is it small? Then what you do is you say, okay, take any arbitrary open cover of A. So let's look at an example. So we have in R2, maybe this thing. So this is an open set in R2. And I want to ask, is this compact? Well, what I do is I let there be an arbitrary open cover of it. So, you know, I could cover it by itself because that's an open cover. And I ask, does that open cover have a finite subcover? So what does that mean? Well, I need to still cover that set, but I need to cover it with things that are in my existing cover that I've already chosen, which in this case only has one open set. All right, so by cover, I mean you need to be able to take a union of the open sets in your collection and cover the entire space, right? It should be a superset. It should contain the set that you're looking at. Um, a in this case, All right? So for us, this is A. And if no matter what open cover I started with, I can find a finite subcover, which means I can take away all but finitely many open sets in this cover and still have a cover, then we say that A is compact. Now, this is nice in the cover that I chose because, well, it's clear that this is already finite, so I don't have to take anything away. However, I can actually construct something, an open cover that shows us that this is not compact. The one would be, um, let's see, maybe take the following, just block off here, because you have a metric, so you can measure distances. So take like one as the distance here. Let me draw in red so it's easier to see. So from this endpoint to over here, there should be a distance of one. And then take the boundary, don't include it, because we need to be open. And then this needs to also not be included. And then the interior is filled in. So this is an open set. And I want to cover um, A by open sets that look like this in a way that there's no finite subcover. So what I do is, okay, I now take one half. So that's from here to here. And I'm going to make, so let's call this U1. Let's call the second one U2. And it should overlap completely with U1 and cover it, but also go up to one half away from this point. So this is U2. And then I'll have U3, which goes up to one third away from that point. And then when uh, U4, which goes up to one fourth of a unit away from that point, and so on. U5, U6, we never quite reach the point, but we do end up reaching every point eventually. And so this is an open cover. It's just that I can't delete all the finitely many of the UIs, because if I have only finitely many UIs, then I have a U in being max, right? The, the largest I. So right, UI is the largest one. If I have only finitely many in a subcover, and that UI only goes um, it only goes up to one over i away from this point, and so it doesn't cover anything less than one over i away from the point. Okay. So we end up missing some of the points, no matter what finite subcover of A we end up taking for this open cover. So I've just constructed an open cover of A which does not have a finite subcover of A, and therefore A is not compact. Okay. <laughs> Now, it turns out that in most of the spaces we're going to look at, 
um, limit point compactness is the same thing as compactness. In fact, any metric space has this property. So if you want to show something as compact, instead of um, finding, instead of showing by contradiction or something that every open cover has a finite subcover, uh, you can instead just show that every infinite set has a limit point. Just show that it's limit point compact. Um, on the contrary, if you're trying to show that a set is limit point is not limit point compact, you can show it's not compact by constructing an open cover which has no finite subcover, like I just did. Okay. In non-metric spaces, in non-metrizable spaces, I should say, spaces that can't be obtained as a metric space, um, as a metric topology from a metric topology, um, those aren't necessarily they don't necessarily obey this condition, right? Limit point compactness may be a stronger thing than compactness in those cases. <clears throat> um, yeah, so compactness, let's see, always implies limit point compactness. So in fact, it would, I said it backwards, it should be weak, weaker, because if you're compact, you're certainly limit point compact. And it's an exercise that you should prove this, and it's pretty easy to do. Right? You just work with the definitions of compactness and limit point compactness, and it, the proof should pretty much fall right out. Um, so that's the idea with compactness. Now, just to see, like, because um, you know you have bounded and uh, closed sets in Rn are limit point compact. Well, those turn out because that's a metric space also to be compact. So the set, subsets of Rn which are compact are precisely the closed and bounded subsets. Okay. So now let's see. Show that a set in the topological space being simultaneously open and closed implies that it is a connected component. I actually had written originally that this was an if and only if, but um, Arpit has corrected that for me. Uh, there are some weird spaces, like non-locally connected spaces, where that doesn't happen. Um, but you should be able to pretty easily show that this is the case. Yeah, this one isn't difficult at all. This falls out of the definition of open and closed as only being made up of interior points for open and then containing all limit points is for closed. Um, and then Finally, the last exercise is take the metric on the complex numbers uh, being defined by the modulus of the difference uh, between two numbers. All right, so if you're familiar with complex numbers, this should be well known to you. Uh, show that C and R2 are homeomorphic under their metric topologies. Okay, so C inherits a metric from this, um, excuse me, inherits a topology from this metric, and R2 inherits a topology from the Euclidean metric. And those two are homeomorphic, so you should be able to actually construct a homeomorphism between them. Okay, and it should be pretty obvious what it should what it is. It's just to give an idea. Um, you take a number a plus ib in the complex numbers, and you map that to ab in R two, and this is a homeomorphism. Just you know, you got to show that it is a homeomorphism. Okay. All right, so that's all for week one stuff. Um, I think, yeah, we have some standard topological spaces we can look at real quick. So DN is the end disk. So what that looks like is just a closed ball in RN. So D2, for example, is just what you normally think of as being a disk, just a closed um, circle with the interior contained. Uh, if you take the boundary of an end disk, you'll get the end sphere. So this is pretty natural, right? You just get rid of the interior and you're left with S1, right? So it's no longer, this would have been D2 with the interior contained, and then you take the interior away and you get S1. So you demote the number that you write. Um, I is the closed interval from zero to one. This is standard. And TN is a uh, product, Cartesian product, of N many copies of S1. So that's the N torus, so the two torus for us. Of course, the one torus is just a circle, but like the two torus ends up being this thing, right? the donut shape that you usually think of. And the idea is every point um, is made up of two angles, theta and phi, and one is the meridian, the angle around the meridian starting from there, so this is theta, and the other one is uh, around this interior, like longitudinal um, ring, so that would be the angle of phi. Okay. And you can construct three tori by taking another copy, so T3, the three torus is S1 cross S1 cross S1. And it gets a natural topology, right? It's pretty easy to see what the topology is from just the product topology. And the topologies on these things look like splotches on the surface. Just open sets there. Okay. And I already showed these spaces. 
but we'll actually construct them and work with them later.